to me.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, Would you stand for the call to worship this morning? It's out of First Peter chapter 1, the first two verses. I'm going to add a little bit to it. I know what the Word of God says about doing that, but you'll understand why in just a moment. To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, as well as New York and PA, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Great last word there. Lord God, thank you for giving us opportunity to gather in the house of the Lord again today. And Father, we look forward to the, to the, uh, uh, um, the, the grace that is ours through Jesus Christ. And the, the, that grace and peace that we can have in abundance. In the tumultuous times in which we find ourselves in, uh, it's good to know that God gives in abundance His grace and His peace. And so, Father, may we just kind of settle into that today, sing the songs of joy along the journey that we find ourselves on. We're going to be participating in communion towards the end of our service, and uh, yet another time to remind us of your great love and mercy for us. And so, Father, as we've gathered, would your Spirit descend upon us and just fill us with your grace and your peace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Grab your hymnal. Let's sing. One hundred seventy-five. This is a old-time song that many of us old-timers have known for a long time. And there's a chorus at the end of it. We're going to sing after the fourth verse, and I'm hoping that we all remember because it's not in the book. I hope we all remember the words. So, just after the fourth verse. <clears throat> I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I have the joy, 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 joy down in, down in my heart to stay. I have the peace of battles, understanding down in my heart, down in my heart. Understanding down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. I have the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I have the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. For there is now no I didn't know that was in our bulletin, uh, in our hymnal. That's uh, that's a great song from Chambers Camp back in the day, and uh, uh, you remember this one? I have the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. I like that verse too. That wasn't in our hymnal, but uh, that was one of my favorite ones. Trying to get all those words out as a kid. I would like to lead you in a responsive reading, if I may. We're in First Peter. Uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Rick Pfeiffer is going to come and read that for us as a scripture lesson a little bit later. But I've wanted to just kind of give you some more of 1 Peter throughout the course of our worship service to kind of just give you a, a, a rounded view of what Peter was talking about and who he was talking to. And so this, uh, uh, this responsive reading, back and forth between you and I, is from 1 Peter chapter 2, 
verses 4 through 10. So as we're reading it together, just realize that what Rick's going to read to us later comes immediately after what we're about to read here. So it's going to give you uh, our verses for this morning in context. All right? So join me in reading this together. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says... Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy." Would you turn your hymnals once again to hymn number 217? Thank you, Lord. Would you stand with me as we sing? This is our prayer hymn, and we encourage you, if you so desire, to come to the altar for prayer. 217.
I heard from, uh, I heard from uh, Lynn Durstein last night that mom's not doing well. Uh, we, we've known this, but uh, just uh, taking a couple more steps back. And so we want to just be remembering Lynn and the family and Betty as well. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Elsie Schock was up spending time with her uh, yesterday evening, and not only as a, a retired nurse spending time with her, but as a, a fellow sister in Christ uh, spending some time with her. So a wonderful thing there. Let's continue to remember Bill Woodward and uh, the things that are happening uh, uh, there with him and for doctors, nurses, wisdom, those kind of things. Lord God, there's many other things that we uh, certainly could mention along the way. Those are the two that uh, you laid upon my heart this morning as uh, I began to, to pray over this service and uh, uh, pray over our building, our time spent together here today. Uh, Father, I know that many uh, will not be with us here today uh, because of some of the new executive orders that have come out. And uh, uh, Father, I just pray that uh, as we uh, do what we do here and do so in such a way as to uh, uh, keep folks safe, that Father, you would continue uh, to... Uh, <clears throat> educate us and uh, inform us of what's really happening in our world today. Father, cut through all the fear and all the, uh, all the political things and get to the heart of uh, uh, matters, we pray, that, uh, Father, we might uh, know the truth and the truth might set us free, as the Bible says. But we are grateful for those that have gathered here in this house and for those that are in the sound of my voice and this video that's going out over Facebook Live. It's good to do church together, even if we can't be here in the house, but we can tune in and uh, uh, check out this video even later on today or maybe live with us here today. Father, we're just so grateful for uh, uh, the, the modern technology that allows us to be together, to, uh, to feel like we're a part of things. And uh, Father, where the Spirit of the Lord is here, the Spirit of the Lord is there as well, in that home, at that dining room table, in that living room. Uh, where those videos are being watched. And so, Father, uh, as the body of Christ, we just want to say thank you uh, for your watch care over us, the, the call to worship, your grace and your peace that comes over us. Even in times that just seem like there, no, there is no peace, you bring a peace that passes all understanding. You bring a peace in abundance, as the Bible says. And so, Father, we are grateful for it, and we ask for even more. We'll take an abundance of grace and peace today. today. Father, as we step into a new sermon series and we look at this idea of being happy campers in the world in which we live, joy for the journey, even during discouraging days, I pray, Father, that the things you've laid upon my heart, I'll be able to communicate in such a way as to lift up God's people, to bring a joy to their heart, as the Word of God says, to consider it pure joy, even though we may be suffering many things. Uh, Father, I pray that you would just fill us with that peace, fill us with that joy, that hope, knowing that you are a God that is above all things, and that, Father, you have it, uh, this world, our lives, uh, this situation, the circumstances of what's happening around us in your capable hands today. And so, Father, would you encourage us? Would you comfort us with those we pray? And, uh, Father, may this uh, time spent together here and on video, may it be a time of drawing us together uh, as fellow believers, but also may it draw us closer to you and to what you want to speak into our lives, how you want to challenge and mold us more like your Son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask these things. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. One more time to the hymnal. Hymn number 624. Count your blessings. 624. <laughs> when upon life's pillows you are tempted. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings. the girl. 
across the Mary, you are called to bear. Count your many blessings, every dove will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 Peter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of God. I love that that passage begins with dear friends, Uh, stuff that we all want to hear. We've all heard the idiom before, happy camper. It's on the front of your bulletin. It's not like that's new to you at all. We've all heard that. It means, uh, it's talking about being a camper, but still, the, the idiom itself means to be a satisfied participant or a person who is content in their circumstances. You know, we, we, we find somebody who's content, somebody who's uh, uh, just, you know, a, 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 you know, a satisfied participant in something. And we say, well, they're a happy camper. Are you a happy camper? Is everything going okay with you? Yeah, I'm a happy camper kind of thing. And, and I would dare say we all know what camping is. Although, when I say that word, I know that even speaking to this crowd that I can see personally and all of you that I can't see, when I say the word camping, I'm amazed at how many different ideas we have going through our heads when it comes to, I mean, some consider camping to be boots, boots in a backpack, hiking down an old forest lane, and, that, and that's, that's, that's camping. You know, others consider it to be a tent, sleeping bags, and a set of pyre irons. You know, all the cooking's going to be done over some sort of a fire, and that's going to be really cool. To others, camping is a pop-up camper in a screen tent around a picnic table at a KOA. You know, someplace where, you know, there's running water that comes in, but we're going to get it in a pail, and, and we're going we're gonna to spend most of our time in, the, in, 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 you know, in this little screen tent away from the bugs uh, at, the, at the picnic table playing Uno. Uh, with our cards or skippo or something, you know, that, that, that's camping. And then there are those who define it with a fifth wheel, air conditioning, and indoor plumbing. Can I get an amen? Yeah, th- there's, a, there's a few of us that are that way are going, yeah, that's camping, brother. And I'm not even counting those who consider camping 
to be the Waldorf Astoria or some other five-star hotel where they have, you know, turn your bed down at night and leave a pillow on, you know, leave a, a mint on your pillow. You know who you are. That's not camping. We're just going to draw the line at the fifth wheels, okay? That kind of thing. I'm not going to use this new series to define what camping is, nor pick on anyone who feels that camping should be slightly more comfortable than cooking over a, qu- a fire or squatting behind a tree. You know, I mean, everybody's got their idea of what camping is, and I'm not here to define it nor pick on anybody who thinks it should be more luxurious than what I think. What I'd like to do, I'd like to look at this concept of camping from the perspective that however you choose to do it, you're away from home. You're not at home, all right? The Apostle Peter makes a statement that Rick just read for us this morning. Listen again to the very first line that he started with. Again, dear friends is how it starts. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Now, Peter calls us aliens and strangers. However, the ESV or the English Standard Version translates the word aliens as sojourners. I put that in your notes. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners. 1 Peter 2.11. A sojourner is a person who stays in a place for a short time, temporarily. They hold no permanent address. The Apostle Paul told us in the book of Philippians that our citizenship, he's talking to Christians, our citizenship is in heaven. That's Philippians 3.20. You see, this world is not our home. We believe that as Christians. We're merely sojourners through this side of eternity. Many of you were in that Sunday school class a few uh, months back, seems like years almost, where we were talking the Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, That whole thing is, is got this this concept going, the Pilgrim's Progress has got this concept that you are a sojourner, you're, you're a camper, you're on your way to a permanent dwelling, you have no actual permanent place. Well, we were created eternal. Sin separated us from God. Christ's death on the cross of Calvary redeemed that relationship. And Jesus went as far as creating a new heaven and a new earth, a new place for us to spend eternity with him. And so on this side of eternity, in this place, in these shadow lands, as C.S. Lewis coined them, we are merely sojourners. We're campers, occupying some space and time, but not permanently residents of this place. Now, there have been plenty of times over the years when being a camper here on this side of eternity has been an absolute joy, right? I mean, you've been around for a while. I've been around. I've been around 52, almost 53 years. There have been plenty of times on this side of eternity that being a camper here on this side of eternity has been a joy. As and yet, as of late, eh, not so much. You know, There's been a few things that have been happening. in our. I don't know if you've been watching the news at all. Maybe you just don't turn the TV on. You, you have no idea what's going on in our world today. COVID-19, masks, murder hornets. I haven't seen those yet, but I've heard a lot about them. You know, uh, Political polarity, riots, looting, defacing monuments. It's hard to be a happy camper some days. Wouldn't you agree? You know, that one look at the news. I know how you could be a happy, happy camper. Actually, you don't even do that anymore. That just showed my age, didn't it? Yeah, it's, it's more like this, that kind of thing. And if you're, if you're really young, you go, Alexa, turn off TV, <laughs> something like that, or whoever in the world that is. You know, It's hard to be a happy camper. H- have you ever gone camping and arrived at your site to find it picture perfect? I'm talking sunny, warm, and scenic only to have the winds change, the clouds roll in, and it begin to pour, ruining both the landscape and your experience pretty quickly. I I took a bunch of campers to Chimney Rock up in the Adirondacks for an overnight camp out. And when we arrived, the place was gorgeous, beautiful. We made camp, we collected firewood, and then we went exploring. We spent most of our time on Chimney Rock itself, which is this wonderful outcropping that looks like a chimney, of course. And we just, a, a bunch of boys, we're just climbing all over it, having a great time. However, while we were up there, we watched a storm roll in on us. And by the time it was over, the tents were flooded, the firewood was wet, the landscape was muddy, and everybody in camp was miserable. You know, it doesn't take long before you're like, this is great, I want to go home. And it was, it was that kind of thing. Likewise, it seems that our world today doesn't have a lot of happy camper experiences either. And so this sermon series, Happy Camper, Finding Joy in the Journey, Even in Discouraging Days. How do I maintain my joy when my camping experience isn't all it's cracked up to be? 
I'm a sojourner. This isn't my real home. I get it. I'm going to a home that Christ has prepared for me. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with my, where I am so that you also may be where I am. I, we, we, we believe this as Christians. So, you know, when I'm on the side of eternity and things don't go real well, how do I maintain that joy? I mean, I've read the, what the Bible says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, James 1, 2. 1, 2. But that's way easier said than done, right? I mean, that's how we feel about it. And so using a camping theme, allow me to take the next few weeks to address various topics on this subject of having joy in our journey, even when some days find themselves to be a little bit more discouraging than others. So let's start with this idea that we are sojourners, convincing you of this idea that we are campers. We are people who should find no permanent address on this side of eternity. We certainly agree as Christians with the writer of Hebrews, I would dare say, who said, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. We're like pilgrims uh, progressing on our way to an eternal home and saying, hey, I'm a sojourner in this, on this side of eternity. I'm just making my way to that place that God has made for me. So allow me to share a few pointers with you as sojourners today to kind of get this series started from what Peter shares with his readers in those two verses that Rick shared with us. Here's the first one I'd like you to see. Number one is to avoid the moral corruption of your surroundings. There are always, always dangers around you when you go camping. From the simplest things like tripping over tree roots, because we don't have any of those where we live, or at least we know where they all are, to uh, being mauled by a bear, which... Some of you, where you live, that's, I guess, something that could happen as well. There are certainly things that when you go out camping, you want to avoid. You want to make sure that you stay away from. Things like poison ivy, exposure to the elements, rap, raging rapids, unsafe drinking water, venomous snakes, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my, you know? I mean, good grief. With a list like that, why would anybody want to, want to actually go camping and get out in the elements? And yet, here's the thing. As Christians, we're... We're merely campers in this world, not permanent residents. You've heard this before. We are to be in the world, but not of it. This is the first pointer that Peter gives us when it comes to sojourning our way through this side of eternity. Here's what he wrote. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens, sojourners, aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. It's no secret that the world we currently camp in is a mess, just a mess. There's no doubt about that. It's fraught with danger. It's filled with all kinds of evil and debauchery, sexual immorality, hatred, discord, filthy language, greed, jealousy, you name it. It's out there. I mean, just one walk around this place in the stores or you turn on the TV, the movies that are out, it's all full of this. Paul told us, to flee such things in 2 Timothy 2.22. He also told us to rid ourselves of such things in Colossians 3.8. Here, Peter is saying that just because you have to camp next to people engaging in such evil activities doesn't mean you should adopt those practices. Just because you got to live with them, just because you got to live near them, maybe you're even married to them. I, you know, just because you have to do life on this side of eternity next to people who are doing these kind of things doesn't mean you should adopt such practices. Peter goes on to say that such desires, check this out, wage war against our very souls. This isn't something that's just going to hurt your reputation. It isn't something that's just going to maybe hurt you physically or hurt you financially or hurt you mentally. No, it's waging war against your very soul, Peter said. People are a mess nowadays, and there are a lot of issues and experiences that we could point to or blame, but the reason is singular. It's sin. That's what we're dealing with. We we want to say, well, it's this person's fault or that person's fault. It's the government. It's it's what's happening there. It's it's the murder hornets. It's we we can lame everything. It boils down to sin. We understand this. All the ridiculousness in our society today boils down to evil desires. Sin run amok. And Peter says that as believers, this world is not our home. We are sojourners. We're campers. And we need to avoid the harmful elements that are around us. We need to abstain from them. 
Think of it this way. If I was hiking out and uh, hiking out along the Appalachian Trail, Appalachian Trail, I think we call that place out there Appalachian, and yet the trail's Appalachian, I think. If I was hiking along that trail and it started to rain, I put on a poncho to protect myself and the equipment that I'm carrying with me. That's just something I would do. If I came across a patch of poison ivy, I would avoid it. I wouldn't roll around in it. Hey, look, poison ivy. Let me take my shirt off and roll around. I wouldn't do that. I would avoid it. If I walked up on a venomous steak, uh, steak, snake, I can say that correctly, I would steer clear of it. I wouldn't poke it with a stick. Okay, I've failed at that one a couple times. Can I get an amen from any guy that's ever poked a snake? Yeah. I mean, you see it and you're like, I'm not, I don't think I've been this close to one of those before. I've done that. And my wife will just roll her eyes over here going, uh-huh, I walked to the car. He stayed back to poke the dumb thing. But you get the point, right? I mean, Paul said it this way. Come out from them and be separate. This is one of the key verses that the Amish turn to to defend their lifestyle. How many times have we heard that from not only them, but even movies about them? They, they end up quoting that 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Now, they may have taken this verse a step further than we choose to take it, but the sentiment, especially the spiritual sentiment of that verse, remains the same, that we are to come out from among them and be separate from them, avoiding that kind of stuff. We're to, we are to be different from the world around us by avoiding many of the dangerous pitfalls that people have fallen into today. We see it around us all the time, and we say, you know, we need to do something about this, step away from it, and to avoid it. And so that's what Peter is starting off with, saying, hey, you know, as sojourners, as campers, just because you end up camping near somebody who's going to do those kind of things doesn't mean you should do it. Which leads us to the next thing Peter says, which is this, which is to, number two, live admirable lives. I've done a lot of camping over the years. Some have been in my air-conditioned, indoor plumbing, nomad travel trailer that I had parked up to camp for over a decade. Yes, I mean, that, that was nice. However, I've also done my share of backpacking, sleeping in tents, and cooking over fires. I did that as well. I was a Boy Scout. And I earned many of the merit badges associated with camping. And so, you know, I, I've done the full gamut of what's been out there. One concept that practically every state, every national park, every campsite, every hiking trail ascribes to is this new, well, I don't know how new the concept is, but it's this leave no trace. Leave no trace is a set of outdoor ethics promoting conservation. It consists of seven different principles. They go like this, plan ahead and prepare. Travel and camp on durable surfaces, dispose of waste properly, leave what you find, minimize campfire impacts, respect wildlife, be considerate of other visitors. These principles apply to any camping experience, whether you're out on the trail or you're, you're parked in an RV park. You know, My old scoutmaster, though, used to take this concept a step further and say that we had to uh, leave things better than we found them. You know, I, he, we didn't have leave, leave no trace. That wasn't around back when I was a kid. But I remember him saying, we always leave our places better than we found them. The day we were leaving a campsite, we would all do that scouring thing. We used to do it at Chambers, too, at the end of teen camp or end of youth camp, where everybody would get in a big, long line and they'd up, up at the road, and we'd walk all the way to the end of the ball field, all in one big, long line, just picking up garbage along the way and, and, and cleaning up. Well, we would do the same thing. We would scour the campsite, clean it up thoroughly, making sure that there was no trace of our scout troop there anymore, but he would also have a stack some firewood close by for the next person coming through. Always had a little kindling, a little a little of that, and just a few different pieces so that the next people, if they rolled in late at night, as long as you know that was dry, they could walk right in and, oh, look, somebody left this for us. With all that in mind, consider what Peter told his sojourners next. He said, Live such good lives among the pagans. I'm going to stop that verse right there because that, there's a lot right there. Live such good lives among the pagans. You're a camper temporarily living on this planet. This isn't your campsite forever and ever. You're just here for a little bit. At times you find yourself having to do life pretty close, pretty close to the pagans as Peter describes them. People not ascribing to your brand of religion. How should you conduct yourselves around them? Live such good lives. 
It's a great phrase. The world in which we live has been overrun with selfishness and sin. People doing what seems right in their own eyes, as the book of Judges says over and over and over again. And typically that means following their sinful desires with no thought of the consequences to themselves, the environment, their neighbors, nothing. I'm going to do what I want to do because it's, it's right for me, and uh, that's just the way it is. Peter's telling Christians that beyond the concept of not engaging in the ridiculous antics of the pagans, believers must set an example of how a good and decent camper should act. I mean, how, how should a person on, on this planet act? Like my scoutmaster would say, we need to leave places better than we found them. When a Christian walks into the lunchroom at break time or at lunchtime, a spirit of peace should accompany them. I don't know how many times over the last several years, uh, as our in-laws have come to our home to visit, you hear from wh whether it's my mom and dad uh, or it's uh, my, my brother-in-law and, and, and his wife and their, their family. I don't know how many times they get in, they sit in our living room, and they're like, I don't know what it is about your place, Pastor. Well, Pastor, they don't call me Pastor. They call me Rob. Uh, but I don't know what it is about this place. As soon as we walk in here, there's just this whew, sense of peace in this place. I'm like, well, we're Christians. We've got the peace of God, the grace of God upon our lives. And yeah, it's a peaceful place. We try not to be very unpeaceful at our home. You come, you, we hope you sense that. When, when a Christian walks into a break room, the, the spirit of peace ought to come in with them. When a Christian stands in the line at Walmart, the overall climate of the crowd should be affected. Somehow people ought to know that there's somebody else different than us in this line here. Boy, that's a, that's a neat person. The Christian should be the preferred babysitter. The Christian should be the preferred salesman, the preferred plumber or electrician. I'm not saying that you shouldn't hire anybody else but them, but I, I'm saying that if you're looking for somebody, you're like, well, who would I really like? You'd prefer the Christian. Why? Because despite the abhorrence the world feels towards our standards, our morals, our principles, which I'm going to get to that in a second, they can't deny the fact that Christians are trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And yes, I stole that from the Boy Scouts this morning. Yeah, that's the type of people we're called to be. Live such good lives. We need to be known for our admirable qualities. We need to leave the world a better place because of our presence in it, wherever we find ourselves. All the while knowing that it's not really our presence, but the one who is present in us, the Holy Spirit of God who makes all the difference. I'm just a representative. I'm just a temple that shows up at the scene with the Holy Spirit of God in me. Here's one more pointer that Peter shares with his campers this morning. Number three, we should be known for our benevolent actions. How many times have we seen campers going the extra mile for those around them? helping them set up their campsite, providing dry firewood, reorienting the lost, administering first aid. In fact, it's actually atypical to run into a mean-spirited, stingy, unhelpful camper. Typically, and I'm talking an actual camper camper. I mean, people who go out to go camping it just seem to have a joy about them anyways. They like getting out there, in the, and, and, and they like to help other people. I, I haven't really met too many who are just, you know, leave me alone kind of thing. I haven't. I'm not saying they aren't out there, but the vast majority of them just seem to be those helpful kind. Well, check out the whole of verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans, but he keeps going, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that's an interesting phrase, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You know it's easy to see how the pagans wish to accuse us of doing wrong. You know, we live in a culture today where we aren't allowed to defend the unborn. We aren't allowed to declare that all lives matter. We aren't allowed to define sexual immorality. We're not allowed to do that. You know, We aren't allowed to disagree with anything that the mainstream considers science or fact, even if they don't have the science or the facts. We're not allowed to do that. And when we do any of these things, we're instantly accused of being racist, sexist, bigots, homophobes, hypocrites, and the like. How many times has a Christian stood for their standards and had that kind of stuff thrown in their face? We're accused of doing wrong all the time. All the time. And yet what Peter is saying is that despite what others might accuse you of, a Christian sojourner should practice benevolence regardless. As believers, we should be known for our benevolent actions. 
I don't remember the guy's name. I probably ought to look it up. But we've been to Ohio to the Amish community a couple times. And each time we go, we go to this place that is a, it's about, about the size of our, three times the size of our gym. And it's a huge mural that, that gives the story of the Mennonites and the Amish and all this in pictures. And they usually have a guy who's standing there kind of narrating it. I remember the first time I went, I went, Oh, golly, we're doing this? Oh, this is terrible. I do not want to sit here and listen to some Amish guy rattle on about his history. He started talking, and all of a sudden he goes, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. I'm like, what? You're done? you got to be kidding. He told such a great story. And, and we walked all the way around the thing. I didn't, even move, I didn't even realize we were moving so much. We'd walked around the entire thing seeing these pictures. One of the stories in there was about a guy who was fleeing the authorities because he was Mennonite. And he was going to be burned at the stake if he got caught. And his, the guy who was chasing after him broke through the ice on a canal. And he turned around and went back and helped him up out of the ice. But he was taken into custody right after that. And even though the guy he freed didn't want him to die, they still burned him at the stake for it. But here's a guy that went back. He's like, I got, I, I'm free. I'm on the other side. It didn't break through for me. But he went back. And I thought, Wow. Even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your good deeds and they'll glorify your God on the day that he appears. The founder of our denomination, John Wesley, wrote in his journal these words, do all the good you can in all the ways you can, to all the souls you can, in every place you can, at all the times you can, with all the zeal you can, as long as ever you can. This is something that every believer should practice and especially with those who might try to accuse us of doing wrong. The Bible teaches us to turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. That's Matthew 5. Give a cup of cold water in Christ's name. That's Matthew 10. Feed your enemy, Romans 12. We're to be known for our benevolent actions, our good deeds. So there you have it. You're a sojourner, a camper. That's how we'll start this series, just making it getting it into your head, this world's not your home. You're just passing through. You're just a camper in this area. And so while you're taking up space and time on this side of eternity, making your way to your permanent dwelling in heaven with Christ, avoid the moral corruption surrounding you. Live admirable lives and be known for your benevolent actions. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to get this Get this series started here today. I look forward to talking on a number of different subjects about what it means to have joy in the journey, even during some discouraging times. And so, Father, I pray that as we uh, turn our attention to a song in just a moment and then to communion together, Father, I pray that as we continue through this service, your grace and mercy might be made known to us. Your peace would descend upon us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Grab your hymnals. Hymn number 72, Fairest Lord Jesus, 72. Would you stand with me as we sing, please? <clears throat>
seated. The food pantry last month was handing out, I, I think I put one up here, uh, the civilian's equivalent to the military's MRE. They were giving these things out, which MRE stands for Meals Ready Meals ready to eat. I know you look at this and you think, really, really? They are a self-contained, individual field ration in lightweight packaging bought by the United States Department of Defense for its service members who use for use in combat or other field conditions where organized food facilities are not available. Thank you, Wikipedia, for that. But they were handing these out and I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Maybe I'll take one of those and stick it in my backpack for hunting or something like that. Well, uh, lots of hikers, lots of backpackers use them in camping trips because of their lightweight and their portability. Well, wouldn't you know it, we have provided you today with a communion MRE, which is a self-contained individual communion course in lightweight packaging bought by the church for our service members for use in celebrating the Lord's Supper in these conditions where the normal elements are not available. Thank you, Robopedia, I guess. I don't know. I know we're not big fans of these, but we're really big fans of the opportunity of participating in communion together. And uh, I don't know what other churches, maybe they just don't like them and they figured they weren't going to do communion. But boy, I, I like to have communion with, with the family of God. So we will use these communion MREs today. So today I'm going to call all you Christian campers, all you Christian sojourners to the table. Uh, to participate once again in the sacred meal that is ours to enjoy, as the Bible says, until Christ comes again and it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God, which is our real home. It's where we're heading as campers, as sojourners. So you who are, you who are uh, walking in fellowship, hiking, camping in fellowship with God and are in love and harmony with your neighbors, and you who do truly and earnestly repent of your sin and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God, and walking from this time in His holy ways, I invite you to draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confession to Almighty God. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I thank you uh, for our communion MREs today. It matters not where we find these uh, elements. It's just the opportunity to, to have them and to be together as the body of Christ. Whether we're in our homes uh, and, and just connecting online or we're here in the sanctuary, it's good to be able to hold them again and remind ourselves once again of your great love and faithfulness to us, your people. And so, Father, as we partake together today, may we do so with joyful hearts, uh, joyful to be on the journey with you until such a time as you call us home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask that you remove that upper clear tab on the top, exposing uh, the, uh, the wafer, the bread, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ it represents today, which was given for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. As we take and eat this, let's remember what Christ did for us on the cross of God, how he died that we might feed on him in our hearts with thanksgiving. Let's partake together. Now I ask that you open that lower tab, if you will, exposing the cup this morning. The cup that represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed on the cross of Calvary. Drink this remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you. And let's be thankful together. Let's partake. Let's pray together again. I give you, a, give you a little bit of a hint. I'm going to close out with the Lord's Prayer together. Debts, debtors. Lord God, I thank you for giving us the opportunity once again to taste the elements and to remind ourselves again that though we may be on a journey, though we may be pilgrims in a progress, we may be sojourners, campers here on this side of eternity, the Spirit of the living God walks with us as temples of the Holy Spirit, and you're with us each step of the way. Communion being a wonderful reminder of what your son, Jesus Christ, did for us, that we might have this relationship 
uh, we might have this fellowship with the Spirit of God in our own lives as we make our way through this existence to our eternal home in heaven. And so, Father, once again, thank you. Thank you for what you've given us. And on this side of eternity, as we continue to travel on, as we continue to sojourn our way to our eternity uh, in heaven, Father, I pray that your presence and your, uh, your mercy, your grace, your peace would be with us as we go. Father, may we be the ones that set a good example to those around us, that they might be drawn to who you are and have opportunity to repent of their ways and to find themselves fellow believers on a journey to a, an eternal home. Thank you for what you teach us in your word. And Father, as we conclude our time together, may we conclude with that prayer that Jesus called for uh, his disciples to learn how to pray. And uh, as he taught them to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may that peace of God that we talked about at the very beginning of the service, which passes all understanding that we have in abundance, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. God bless you. Have a great day.